you'll have to forgive me for the quality of this video. Uh, I don't have followers or worshipers of me that are sending me $1,500 laptops, and uh, that's not what I desire either. I'm going to read this to you, a sermon, and uh, God put it on my heart. If you want to listen, I pray that you will, but if you don't want to, just click off now and just go. I don't know what else I can do for you. Uh, if you don't want to listen, if you want to come in and just curse, I'm just going to block you. But if you want to listen and if you want to hear the truth and you're not afraid to be convicted, if you really want to know what's going on, I pray that you'll listen. Paul said to Timothy in his first letter, Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. 1 Timothy 5.20 so those of you who persisting in sin, practicing sinning, you're to rebuke them, scold them, warn them in the presence of all so that others will fear. You may ask, why is he doing this? I will tell you, God pressed it on my soul. Expose the false teachers. I don't have three payment options below. Example, oh, some of you have asked, how could you donate to my ministry? Yet if you're tithing, you're under a curse. But it's okay to give to me. I don't want your money. If you offered me a billion dollars to stop what I'm doing, I would say, no, God's truth will get out. I just pray that these will not be used as a witness against you and that you will act on the truth instead of chalking up your eternal life to a big joke. And it's not. You've believed fables. You want the Word of God to be taught to you in the right context. And what did Paul really mean by that? By a teacher with no authority who consistently dumbs down and dilutes God's holy Word. Why? Because you can't handle the full strength, and that's just the truth. You think it's cool and funny to be told, hey, you don't have to follow Jesus to be saved. In fact, when reading the Bible, if it doesn't make you feel good, if you come under conviction, just put on some grace goggles and you call yourself a Christian. When the power of God's word is messed with, decreased, bended, twisted, manipulated, the edge is taking off, is taken off like a dull knife it cannot cut through to the very core of one's hearts and intents. The word of God will not pierce through when it's dull. Hebrews 4, even though you're told Hebrews is uh, not for us, no salvational properties or any issues, uh, it's not meant for us, not meant for the Gentiles. I will tell you, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Pretty powerful stuff for just one verse. A discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yet you're told the entire book of Hebrews not meant for you. That's a lie. Amidst a sea of lies that you are latching on to, the same videos day in and day out, the same theme that you're hearing, and the same comments, oh yes, you're right. Everything you say, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so blessed to have you as a teacher. You're so wonderful. Yes, grace, grace, grace. And then on to the next video. Yes, it's so wonderful, so great. It's so great to be eternally saved. You must be first saved to claim that. You, don't, you can't just uh, let someone pronounce you saved. God has to save you first. You must be born again. So you're locked in to this air. It's called the spirit of air. It's a false Holy Ghost. And the devil will give it to you gladly. And he'll drag you right down to hell with him. When the word of God is tampered with, the effect is not there. 
It doesn't take on the same effect. It can't. So there's no conviction. There's no godly remorse or grief or conviction over your sin. Then people will take on a whole new, what the Bible calls the spirit of error, a false Holy Ghost. And again, the devil is more than happy to give it to those who want to listen to his teachers. Listen to what Paul calls it later in 1 Timothy. I'll tell you that in a minute. But when they bend it a little here, twist it a little there, say, oh, it's out of context. Now, what does it really mean here? You have to ask yourself, why are they doing this? Why is there this pattern of cunningly devised fables, well-scripted and almost authoritative sounding? Fables, these people that despise authority and speak evil of dignities. God says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Ephesians 5.11, expose them. That's what he's told me to do. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust, in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, especially those who follow their filthy bodily lusts and despise God's authority. These false teachers are bold and arrogant and show no respect for the word of God. They show no respect to born-again believers. And so what is the pattern of people that when you rebuke them, as Paul says to do, when you instruct them, what do I often hear? What do I often see? Because they've taken on this false spirit, what happens? They'll either block you or they'll curse you out or they become enraged. And this, my friend, the Holy Ghost would never do. Why? Because if Christ is living in a person through the Holy Ghost, there is going to be loving kindness, patience, the ability to be instructed, the uh, ability, humility to take correction, and sometimes to have to admit, you know what, you're right, I was wrong. But those that despise authority, I just told you, especially those who follow their filthy bodily lusts, and despise God's authority. These false teachers are bold, full of pride, arrogant, and hate to be exposed. Do you know anyone like this? They despise authority. It's a Jezebel spirit. May even claim to be a great teacher, and yet they preach a gospel that takes on a licentious overtone, if you will. It's everyone gets this thought that, well, now since I'm no longer under the law and under grace, the mindset is I can do what I want. It's not a salvation issue. You're not dead to sin. You're still dead in your sins. That means you've not been born again. When you try to instruct these people in what Jesus says, what the word of God says, what Paul had to say, Paul suffered too when he was getting the word out. He preached about sound doctrine. Make sure to be careful of these false teachers. And yet you're heaping them up due to your lusts because you can't endure sound doctrine. He warned believers. He warned churches about these false doctrines and false teachers. Devils that will teach doctrines of demons. What do you say about the last days? Earlier, I talked to you about the word of God being dull, diluted, bended, even in some cases, entire books taken out. Oh, that's not meant for us. So who gave them the authority to take God's word out? They will pay for it with their very souls. Read the last few chapters of Revelation 22. So what happens? 1 Timothy 4 1. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith 
and follow deceiving spirits and doctrines taught by demons. I've made several videos about this already. You know exactly who I'm talking about. These people who are indwelt with demonic spirits, the Jezebel spirit, the Ahab spirit, lying spirits, false spirits, you follow them because you're told you don't have to follow Jesus Christ, but you follow these teachers willingly and with glee and happiness. You count on them for everything and you love them and you adore them and you worship them. You do not worship Jesus Christ. What is so wrong about being obedient to Jesus Christ? What is it that you're afraid of? What sin is it that you're not willing to let go? God knows. So what is it? So instead of accepting the truth, you come up with your own doctrine, hyper grace, free grace, what's known as antinomianism, comes from two Greek words, anti meaning against and nomos meaning law. Antinomianism means against the law. Stay with me for a second. Theologically, antinomianism is the belief that there are no moral laws God expects Christians to obey. Antinomianism takes a biblical teaching to an unbiblical conclusion. The biblical teaching is that Christians are not required to observe the Old Testament law as a means of salvation. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled the Old Testament law. The unbiblical conclusion is that there is no moral law God expects Christians to obey. The Apostle Paul dealt with this in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that dead to sin continue any longer therein? The most frequent excuse of hyper grace, free grace, faith alone, is that it encourages and almost promotes sin. People may wonder or say, if I am saved by grace and all my sins are forgiven, why not sin all I want? He paid for it. There is no remorse. Oftentimes, they'll curse at you and even laugh at you, laugh you to scorn, and mock you for your obedience. This kind of action or thinking is not the result of true conversion, because true conversion yields a greater desire to obey, not a lesser one. God's desire and our desire when we are regenerated, born again, by his spirit is that we strive not to sin out of gratitude for his grace and forgiveness we want to please him first john 3:22 god has given us his infinitely gracious gift in salvation through jesus our response is to consecrate our lives to him out of love worship and gratitude for what he has done for us not curse at others, not making videos, casting people into hell if they don't agree with you, saying to them, I hope you get raped by demons. I hope you die of cancer. Why don't you go stick a screwdriver up your nose? Does that sound like someone who's been born again? Dear friend, that is the devil. Antinomianism is unbiblical in that it misapplies the meaning of God's gracious favor. Those that think they now have that gracious favor, favor go in the direction of abusing it, the grace. So in fact, you never had it. 1 John 3, 9 makes it very clear. A born-again believer cannot practice sin. Not with God's seed in him. He won't allow it. So you'll say, well, I'll be chastened. I'll lose rewards. Have you been chastened? Do you even think about heaven? Or you're so caught up in being told what you want. I'll ask you, where is your heart? On the temporary things of the world or on eternal things in heaven? 
Where are you storing your treasure? A born-again believer is dead to sin. They will not abuse grace. They will be chastened. They cannot be comfortable in sin. But hyper-grace, you'll hear, it's not a salvation issue. You said believe. Just a one-time moment of faith. You're good. You can even murder people and stop believing. What is this law God expects us to obey? It is the law of Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And for those of you who want to say the heart and mind is the same thing, Jason Jack, when someone asked you, is there a difference? Is there a delineation between heart and mind, Mr. Doctor? You tell the person it's the same thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. No, we are not under the Old Testament law. We are under the law of Christ. The law of Christ is not an extensive list of legal codes. It is a law of love. If we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will do nothing to displease him. And we strive to do things that are pleasing unto him because we love him. And we try to be obedient because we love him and because we are saved, not in an attempt to get saved. You cannot earn salvation. You can't keep your salvation by obedience. Obedience is a fruit of salvation. It's not what gets you saved. But you'll see it in people that are saved. It's a sure sign when they're obedient to the word of God and when they're doing what they know God wants them to do, when they're in the will of God. You'll, you'll notice a Christian immediately within 10 seconds. Your spirit will witness with theirs immediately. You may not even have to say anything. Happens all the time. Obeying the law of Christ is not a requirement to earn or ma maintain salvation. That's lordship. The law of Christ is what God expects of a Christian and what will most certainly happen as a result of being born again, not in an attempt to get born again. And you'll hear it over and over and over and over from these hyper-gracers. Oh, he's lordship. Backloader works. I'm not counting on my works, dear friend. Anything that I have in my life is a genuine love for God because of what he did for me and what he produces in me through the Holy Ghost. Nothing that I do. You have no contrition, no brokenness over your sins. Your heart is yet to be converted. What does his eternal gift truly mean to you? That you can still go out and do whatever you want? Is that what you're being told? It's not a salvation issue. Antinomianism is contrary to everything the Bible teaches. God expects us to live a life of morality, integrity, with love. Jesus Christ freed us from the burdens and the commands of the Old Testament law, but that is not an excuse or a license to sin, but rather a covenant of grace. Peter made it very clear. Do not use your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. What is it so hard to understand about that verse alone? Do not use this grace that you now have as a cloak to cover up your sin. God forbid. Romans 6, it mentions it a few, time, few times. Verse 15 says, what, shall we then sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? There's that word obedience. I know it's a scary word to you, and you have a hard time with it like it's a dirty word. Do you realize Jesus Christ died on a cross for you? 
He paid the penalty for your sins. Yet you have no desire to be obedient in your life. After someone was brutally beaten, whipped, scourged, spit upon, a crown of thorns pressed into his head, mercilessly beaten, and yet you're told, you don't have to follow that. Are you serious? Are you blind? Are you insane? Why are you following false teachers? Follow Jesus Christ. You must be born again, dear friend. I am pleading with you to get away from these false teachers. Yes, you understand that Jesus Christ died on a cross for you. Yet to you, what kind of gift is it? Is it such a great gift that you can say, well, now I can still do that because that's not a salvational issue. Like you're going to go up to heaven and have a conversation with Jesus. Well, I know I couldn't stop those things because, well, I was told it wasn't a salvational issue and that, you know, you paid for it. You know what John said when he saw him in the third heaven? I fell at his feet as dead. And that was John who had walked with him and who was with him on this earth. And when he saw him in all his glory, he fell at his feet like a dead person. And you think you're just going to waltz right on up there? Hey, Jesus, you know, thanks for dying for me. I appreciate it. It was so great. Thank you for that great gift. I just rested the whole time. You know, it was just such a great rest. You have no desire to be obedient to him because you've not been born again. Only God can give you that desire to be obedient. We are to strive to overcome sin and cultivate righteousness, depending on the Holy Spirit to help us. We can't do this on our own. The fact that we are graciously freed from the demands of the Old Testament law should result in our living lives in obedience to the law of Christ. 1 John 2 through 3 through 6 declares, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must also walk as Jesus did. And so when you rebuke these filthy dreamers, these despisers of good, those who have no desire or any unction at all to do anything for Jesus Christ, to walk pleasing unto him, or to have any fruit in their lives, they even mock people, watch out for fruit inspectors. That's what the cross means to you. So you say, grace, grace, grace. I hear it all the time. You despise the work of the cross, you backloader. And you're the ones pressing the crowns in even further. I despise the cross. By doing what the Bible says, obeying the gospel, obeying Jesus Christ. Keeping the commandments means you guard them. You hold them close to you. They are precious to you. They are not burdensome to you. Nobody can keep the Ten Commandments without fail. It can't happen. We are under grace. But God gives us that grace and that obedience and that desire to obey his commandments because we love his law. We love his commandments. They are not burdensome to us. Are they burdensome to you? How do you treat them? How do you treat Jesus Christ? Are you told you don't have to follow Jesus? If you don't like something in the Bible, if it makes you feel bad, just put on some grace goggles. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, 
without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And you encourage others to do it. And I'm the one that despises the cross. My friend, you may be a false convert. If you are getting enraged or you lash out, you don't like what you're hearing because you can't endure sound doctrine, you've taken on the spirit of error. Your heart will become harder each day that you listen to a lie. It will continue to get harder and you will walk further and further and further away from the truth. As long as you have your little clique of friends that are going to pump you up and make you feel good and confirm that you're going to be just fine, welcome back, glad you came back to the fold, everything's good here, got to watch out for those uh, fruit inspectors over there. Is that the new heart when you see cursing at others that are in disagreement with you, calling you a scumbag, saying filthy things about others, absolutely filthy, totally classless, as one person put it. People like Paul Frutivore, Matthew Gordon Carell, also known as Jack Smack, Renee Rowland, these people who preach a licentious gospel, is this who you're following? People like Neon de Bundu, who's quick to defend her queen, who's quick to defend this doctrine. And if you don't like it, you can get the hell out. Rip half the Bible out, she says. There are many false spirits out there, friend. Which one are you following? You will see it when you see that arrogance come out. You will see it when you know they despise authority, when they refuse correction, they despise the word of God. Is that Christ living in this person? If you're not born again, it will be hard for you to pick up the spirit of error because you may already have the spirit of error. So you're in agreement with them. But I'm the one teaching the falsehoods, right? Yet not one person not one has shown me one verse, one video, not a minute mark anywhere ever in one of my videos where I've told a lie. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, I lie not, and God knows it. I'm here to tell you the truth, and if you don't want to listen to it, that's on you, not on me. But I'm going to keep preaching the truth and you can keep rejecting it. And I pray that it's not a witness against you, but that you'll act on it. And that something will spark in your heart or in your mind or your, you'll feel conviction. What I've told you, you'll see it and you'll say, hey, he said, watch out for that. I'm seeing something that is not right here. Now, what am I going to do? Am I going to follow this person? Or am I going to follow Jesus Christ? Or am I going to follow someone who says, you don't have to follow Jesus Christ? Is that what you're going to follow? Is that what you think is truth? When Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. When he said, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Are you following Jesus Christ or are you following a false Teacher, you cannot take on and listen to false doctrine and be born again. It's impossible. Second John makes it very clear. You have neither the Father nor the Son. The Bible says, he that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. So if you've taken on a false doctrine that just said you don't have the Father or the Son, if you're not in Christ's doctrine, then you don't have eternal life. You have a false spirit 
of air and you refuse for anyone to tell you any differently. God is giving you space to repent, dear friend, and that's not a bad word. It's a gift from God, and he will grant it to you. Repentance unto life, where for the first time in your life, you will know what it means to grieve over your sin. You will understand, just even if it's minutely, what Christ suffered on that cross on that day. And it will mean something to you, not for you to say, he paid for it, so it's not a salvational issue. That's not going to be the mindset, dear friend, of someone that's born again. You will not have that heart like that. God gives you a new heart and a new spirit. So do you have that new heart and new spirit, or are you just listening to people due to your own lusts because it's what you want to hear? because you can't endure sound doctrine. And you'll believe anything they'll say. And you'll have all these people coming down below you. Yeah, she's right. Or you're right. Every, we're just right. Everything's right. Yes, that's the way it is. And oh, it's so great. We're just resting now. I'm glad I'm going to a church that preaches what I want to hear. Is that you? Are you seeking Jesus Christ? Are you seeking to follow Jesus Christ? One person the other day told me, if you don't tell me what I want to hear, if you don't say yes to these questions, I'm blocking you. And he blocked me. Because I didn't compromise. What am I supposed to do? Compromise my faith in the Word of God so that I could tell this person what he wants to hear? So that it makes him feel good? No, because the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And yet, if I'm going to say, don't worry about that, don't listen to that, man, put your grace goggles on, what's wrong with you, no, that's not meant for you, would I be doing that person any justice? Would I be telling them the truth? No, I would be telling them a fable. Friend, works is evidence of God doing miraculous things through the Holy Ghost in your life. It's not what you do. It's what he does and what he did. There will be a change. Belief is an action. But if you're told you can stop believing and even murder people now, you really believe that. You are following cunningly devised fables, deceiving the hearts of the simple. You must be born again. I pray that you will take this truth and act on it. Or you can turn back to your fables that you're comfortable with because you don't like to be convicted. And you'll have about 10 or 15 people that will confirm everything that you want to hear. Yeah, we're glad to have you back. It's so glad to see you again. We're glad that you, now that you know the truth, we're glad to have you back. And you're going to hear everything that you want to hear from us. You're never going to feel under conviction over here. No way. Is that what you're following? You have no idea when your last breath will be. Our life is but a vapor. Here for a little while, then gone. But God knows, my friend. He knows the very second you will die. So. Are you going to follow those who tell you what you want to hear or are you going to act on the truth? I pray that you will act today. Today is the day of salvation. Yet for those who stiffen their neck, who don't want to listen to it, that are constantly warned over and over and over, but you don't want to hear it, turn away from it. You stiffen your neck. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. God says he will suddenly destroy you without remedy. What's it going to be? Make a decision. Make the right one. Thank you for watching. And in Jesus' name, his glorious and beautiful 
In precious name, I pray that you will act on the truth and that you will act on it now.